with my memo. Tonight, it is about two individuals whose stories have in the past week elicited strong reactions. Immaculate Auma and Boniface Wangeshi Murage. Immaculate is a mother who carried the body of a six-month-old baby for about five kilometers from Bagathi Hospital to City Mortuary to Kenyatta Hospital Police Post, then back to City Mortuary because officials at Bagathi could not help transport the baby's body. She was forced to walk from Bagathi Hospital to a police post, a police post where she was required to file a death notification. Then this grieving mother, holding tightly to the lifeless body of her child, walked back to the mortuary where the attendants kept her waiting for hours. Immaculate and her mother Lynette sat on the concrete bench at the mortuary for three hours waiting to be attended to, the two women holding the corpse in turns as they waited. They could not afford to take the body to a private mortuary. This state of affairs at the mortuary was apparently caused by the Nairobi County Workers' Strike. The baby had died while being attended to at Magathi, having been diagnosed with pneumonia at a clinic in Kibera. Now, Boniface Wangeshi Moragi, on the other hand, was charged in court with the offense of stealing his one-month-old baby from Kenyatta Hospital. Moragi was unable to raise the 56,937 shillings required to clear his hospital bill. And so his wife and baby had been detained because of this outstanding payment. And Murage saw no other option but to put the baby in a carrier bag and attempt to sneak her out of the hospital. But his escape was cut short by guards at the hospital entrance. Murage and his young family got overwhelming public support after his court appearance. The bill was paid in full. He got a lawyer to defend him pro bono. He was given money, shopping for the family, and a promise of a job. Murage's action was no doubt inexcusable, but just like the case of Immaculate, it speaks volumes about what is not right with our health sector. If in one short week, one woman has to carry her child's corpse on her hands and a man is forced to steal his own child from a hospital for lack of money, then you know it can't get any worse than that. In fact, after Immaculate's ordeal made it to the public domain, the Nairobi County admitted that lack of a utility vehicle at the hospital, non-vigilant security guards, and an inefficient flow of information at the county hospital led this desperate mother to take the agonizing walk to the mortuary. Someone said to me recently that maybe the government should have started with just one big agenda, universal health care. Sort that out, give it all the attention, and then look elsewhere. Anything short of that risks turning the so-called big four into the big falsehoods. That's my memo. Very true. My kicker tonight addresses the eight commissioners, now former of the National Land Commission, NLC, whose six-year term ended this week. Ladies and gentlemen, I will be straightforward with you. You have left the country with more questions than answers, more problems than solutions. On the main question as to whether the NLC delivered on its core constitutional mandate of managing public land on behalf of the national and county governments, and indeed the ordinary Kenyan citizen, you left Kenyans far less than satisfied. Many had hoped that you will stay true to the mandate assigned to you by Article 67 of the Constitution and work with the integrity, energy, and confidence of a constitutionally independent body to make a clean break in relation to how public land is managed and administered. As the first set of commissioners of the NLC, you had the responsibility to set the standards and ensure that Kenya finally gets it right and fair, things to do with public land that includes school playgrounds, forests, road reserves, water catchment areas, rivers and lakes, and even airport land. The NLC was the long-awaited messiah, but for six years, the inaugural team of the commissioners treated Kenyans to a shameful show of internal divisions compounded by allegations of corruption and incompetence. And as they depart the stage tonight, a thorough audit of the last six years would be necessary, even as the country begins the search for the next set of commissioners. The newly energized ESCC and the Directorate of Criminal Investigation, DCI, should immediately commence investigations into the dealings of the NLC ranging from the standard gauge railway compensations to land dealings such as Waraka School and Weston, as well as the lease renewals, including those of Kakuzi Limited in Thika, among others. 
A lifestyle audit of the exiting commissioners should also be part of the investigations if to explain why so much went so wrong at the NLC for six years. And now, what is the future of the NLC? I project here that Kenyans should not raise their expectations. Things could get worse. Ugly tussles between the Ministry of Lands and the NLC had been witnessed from 2013, and that there was a clear proof that sections of government are not interested in a strong, well-functioning and independent NLC. Should those elements in government have their way, the next set of NLC commissioners will include spineless political yes-men, character weaklings, and partisan mercenaries that will quickly drive the NLC to the ground and return the management of public land back to the drain. For now, I can only hope against that dreadful scenario. Meantime, good night, Sazuri and co. And before I also bid them good night, let me talk about a gentleman called Joshua Musimi, the Director of <coughs> Research and Planning in the Office of the Controller of Budget. He was before the Finance Committee in the Senate, and he said something, and I really hope that I had him right. This is what he said, and I quote, we are collecting 1.6 trillion shillings as revenue every year, and we are paying a debt of 1.1 trillion shillings annually. What you are left with cannot even pay salaries. Look, are we in a situation? Probably we are. Is the country facing tough economic times? Most likely. And this is in line, or at the same time when the president has been talking about the Big Four agenda, one year later. Are we achieving that Big Four agenda? Is there sufficient time, <coughs> sufficient resources to make this Big Four agenda a reality? Probably to borrow what Jamila was saying, maybe we start with one big agenda, one at a time, instead of four at the same time, because probably we may end up with a big four lie, very big one. So probably it's time to think back, take a step back and ask three years and a half for President Uhuru Kenyatta, is the big four agenda achievable or will it be yet another lofty project kind of a <coughs> promise that may be a big failure? Big Four Agenda. My take tonight is about the issue that was brought about by our investigative reporting here on citizen television that has got everyone talking. The issue of skin bleaching. Now while it may seem superficial and fickle and vain, I believe it is more than skin deep. In the conversations I have seen about this issue, most people's advice is pretty simple. Love the skin you're in, they tell you. Accept yourself just the way God made you. God makes no mistakes. Black is beautiful. It's as simple, doesn't it? Well, I don't think it is. You see, the issue of skin bleaching is much more than just how one looks. It's about an identity, a sense of belonging. It is about silent biases the unspoken prejudices that some of us may not even realize we have. It is about access to opportunities. You see, for decades, light skin has been equated with beauty. In fact, the two words are synonymous. Dark skin equals struggle. Conversely, light skin equals blonde, if you know what that means, and an easy life. A dark-skinned person will have to work twice as hard to prove themselves. They'd have to be smart. Because, heck, what else do they have going for them, right? Light-skinned persons also face prejudices. Light-skinned women are assumed to have nothing between their ears, and their rise in life would always be questioned. Did they get up there by merit or other means? These perceptions, ladies and gentlemen, don't come from planet Mars. They come from us here on Earth. Remember the young lady who was charged and convicted of murdering her boyfriend, Ruth Kamande? She was crowned Miss Langata, dubbed beauty behind bars. In fact, an MP who was seeking a commutation of her death sentence to life imprisonment said this in a television interview. She said, this girl is so beautiful. She's so young. She has lost her entire life. That is enough punishment. 
So if one is beautiful, and by now you know what that means, then they get away with murder, literally. Folks, when skin tone becomes a means to upward mobility, when one feels discriminated against or denied an opportunity because of their skin tone, then it goes beyond self-esteem. And even if we're to look at it purely from the self-esteem angle, it should concern us as a human race that 60 million people around the world are lightening their skin or are lacking self-esteem, as we like to put it. Why are 60 million people so insecure? Who or what makes them so insecure? These are tough questions we have to answer beyond condemning these people and making sweeping statements about why they bleach their skin. Let me finish by quoting a statement from media personality Valentine Joroge. She said, you can have all the esteem in the world and be confident in your abilities and beauty, but you cannot self-esteem yourself out of discrimination. Light skin is over-sexualized, becoming a hurdle to climb at work, and dark skin is dismissed as unattractive. Coloring costs women, both light and dark, promotions, jobs, and other opportunities." End quote. I'll leave it at that. That's my take tonight. <clears throat> now, tonight my angle is about a conversation that has been going on on social media for a good part of today. In fact, it formed part of our news tonight. It concerns an image seemingly of the Chief Justice David Maraga at what appears to be a public rally or public gathering being addressed by the Deputy President William Ruto. One can safely assume that this picture was taken at one of those roadside gatherings right after that big event in Kisi yesterday, also addressed by President Uhuru Kenyatta and ODM leader Rai Laudinga. Now, the bone of contention here seems to be about whether, as Chief Justice, David Maraga should be seen at such gatherings that inevitably turn political. In other words, does he run the risk of appearing subservient to the executive or indeed the political class? In fact, notable political figures such as Sierra Senator James Orengo have complained about Maraga's presence there. It was, in fact, a big issue at the Senate today. Then there is the argument that this was a fairly innocuous meeting simply meant to launch various facilities at the Kisi Teaching and Referral Hospital and elsewhere. And this, of course, happens to be the ancestral backyard of the Chief Justice. What would be wrong with the son of the soil gracing such an important event in his home county? Some have asked. I will not pretend to resolve this conundrum, but I know for a fact that this touches on the very conversation we don't have, we don't want to have in this country, I dare say one we have refused to have in this country, a conversation about standards. Just who ought to do what where? We can even agree on when people are supposed to step aside over corruption. Is it when they are adversely mentioned? Is it when they are charged, when they are jailed? I don't know. No one does. Everybody takes the position that favors them at that time. Is it normal, for instance, that Orengo's party leader was in fact attending this very meeting while he is in fact supposed to be the leader of opposition? This was a presidential function, was it not? Or did I miss something? Or which standard are we applying here? I think about, think about running for office, for example, in this country. Is there anything at all that can bar any Kenyan from running from any office at any time? Haven't we heard that governors with no genuine degree certificates have apparently ran for office and got away with it? Or corrupt politicians being cleared f to contest for seats and actually winning them with a landslide? Didn't we just deal with the shame of having to recall our ambassadors? Yes, I said ambassadors to return home, not to receive some presidential award, but to face corruption charges. Come on, need I mention that we don't even have standards for deciding who is or is not a national hero? I wasn't going to mention the Githeri man, but seriously, I wish in this Maraga conversation we had some principle or law or some practice to rely on. Don't tell me about chapter six. It means nothing, absolutely nothing, zero, zilch. When was the last time anyone used it and to do for anything other than the colorful speeches at civil society conferences and university lecture halls? So let's go ahead 
and do whatever we want. Let the CJ or any other judge or the president or the governor or the ODM leader or yourself hang out with whomever. I mean anyone, anywhere, anytime, under any circumstances, in any way, for any reason. Because anyway, that is the Kenya we want, don't we? Oh, yes. Good night. <laughs> Yvonne, you won. Yes. yes. Just okay. say it in a but full hey, sentence. Hey. That is okay. what? That's Arsenal? Yeah, full, say it in a full sentence. But, but is the Arsenal team won, you did well, We've against the unknown team but whose Borisov. name we cannot Three pronounce. Zero. We are well winning done. there. At least, at least there are some standards <laughs> in football. A, you, you know, and none winning. it seems here. Wow. Yeah, but, but Joe, Thank that was you. awesome. That was Joe, that was fantastic. We are investigating to know which team that was. That's what I'm that telling her. Him. Congratulations for winning the Champions League. Oh, yes, oh, oh, good yes, night, everybody. Shouldn't this show be ending now? <laughs> News gang is a hashtag. Keep talking. We'll see you again next week.